Good morning, everyone. My name is Deb Kidwell, and I'm the Director of Technology Initiatives for the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. I want to welcome you today to today's MEC Security Services webinar, The Educator's Guide to Outsmarting the Puppet Master. A few reminders as we begin. The resources from this webinar will be made available on the MEC website after the event. We do encourage you to submit any questions you may have throughout the webinar using the Q&A button on your screen. At the end of the presentation, we do ask that you complete the survey that you will be sent so that we can hopefully improve and offer better webinars in the future. So a little bit about the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. It was legislatively created and it serves the Midwest Census region of 12 states. We're headquartered in Minneapolis and we're also known as MEC or some people spell it out as MHEC. We're one of four regional higher education compacts, the other three being the New England Board of Higher Education, the Southern Regional Education Board, and the Western Interstate Commission. Our technologies program includes a community of institutional volunteers that offer advice and guidance to MEC, as well as a technology contracts portfolio that is designed to meet our community's needs. So a little bit about the MEC Technologies community. If you have any questions about the community, you're welcome to contact me, but we'd like to engage IT innovators and specialists from service areas for technology, academia, students, and administration. So one of the opportunities that our community identified was cybersecurity. This was an area where we learned that both contracts and education were needed. Our presenters today are one of our partners that holds a contract with MEC, and we're thrilled to be able to provide this type of educational session through that partnership. To learn more about the technologies community, you'll see a link on your slide that you can go to after the presentation. So what are MEC's technology contracts? Those are simply said contracts that are available to public and private not-for-profit institutions, higher education institutions, as well as cities, government, schools, and such throughout the MEC region and possibly throughout our compact partners. So as our role in higher education is growing, contracts are needed that might not traditionally be considered technology. So do check our contracts list out at mec.org slash contracts. And if you have any questions, contact Nathan Sorensen. So today's webinar is one of a series. This is the second one in our series. There are a total of five with three upcoming. If you would like to attend one of the future webinars, you can subscribe to our technologies newsletter to get notifications, or you can just go to our website and make a note of those dates and times. So today's webinar, as I said, is part of, presented in partnership with InfoSec Institute. We have Megan Saul from InfoSec and Ken Rees, who is from UW River Falls and Stout presenting today. They do have a MEC contract. It's the num contract number is on your screen. That was a competitively bid solicitation and the contract covers security awareness training services. So if you have any questions about these contracts, don't hesitate to reach out to MEC staff and we'll be happy to help. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Ken. Good morning and thank you for joining us this morning. As Deb mentioned, I'm Ken Reese and I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at the University of Wisconsin River Falls and Stout. I've been here about three years and prior to this I've got about 20 years of experience in higher education serving as a CIO and a CISO at a number of different institutions including a brief period of time at MEC so I've got a little bit of history there. University of Wisconsin has been an InfoSec customer for a number of years, and Megan called me up and asked me if I'd like to, to co-present with her, and I jumped on the opportunity as social engineering and information security awareness are two of the things I've been most interested in over my past uh, several years of my career. Uh, so with that, Megan, I'll toss it over to you. Thanks, Ken, and thanks for joining me today. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm VP Marketing here at InfoSec, and I actually lead the, the product and the content and the brand marketing teams. And social engineering is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, as we'll get into later on. Um, there's a really fine line that, that exists between really good marketing and sometimes social engineering. So, Ken, let's go ahead and, and jump into it. All right, so first off, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is going to be a really kind of a fun presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in chat. 
Uh, we'll do our best to get to them during the presentation and we'll have a little bit of opportunity at times to just sit back and, and answer questions as well. I'm really excited to talk about this because this is, like I mentioned, it's an area of interest to me. Uh, social engineering is probably our biggest weakness in the information security front. You know, we've got a lot of tools and technology we put into place to try to manage a lot of the, the technical aspects of security, but the human aspect of security can be more challenging for us. We're going to share a few examples today and give you an idea of how you could strengthen your organization, some things that you can do uh, practically to approach social engineering, things to think about as you consider this. Uh, and as we do that, we're going to stop and we're going to take a look at what social engineering actually is and why it's so effective in getting around some of your security barriers that you already have in place. You know, one of the trickiest pieces of this is that it's not really a technical attack. It's you know, so your security tools aren't necessarily going to be enough to thwart social engineering. People like to work around it. And we're going to give you some examples based on some popular media that we'll take a look at uh, to kind of tell the story. And then we're going to get into some practical examples from the field. Because social engineering is really about exploiting people instead of the technology to gain access into our building systems finances. You know, it's, it's where people like you and me become the vector for the attack. Uh, Megan? Yeah, and one of the most interesting things to me about social engineering is it it's everywhere. So like Ken just hit on, it's it's not just this technical thing that only your IT team might talk about, right? It can be email, one-to-one -one conversations. Um, if you've been following the news the last decade, the target HVAC attack, right, is one of the classic examples where someone impersonated what normally seemed to be a, a maintenance crew and successfully penetrated a, a major corporation. And so, as I alluded to in my introduction, there's a very blurred line between social engineering and just really good marketing. So, if you've ever purchased like Girl Scout cookies before, I know I never have all the time I might do this, <laughs> or rounded up your purchase amount at like a local checkout chain to, to support a charitable cause. Those are deliberate hooks put in place to get you to take action for good. And of course, the dark side of social engineering um, generally pass, skips right past that cookie request and goes right for a wire transfer or privileged access into your environment. And so a few good examples of social engineering that happens really in, in every day, if you, if you work in IT or even outside of it, you, you see these come into your, your inbox or, or your work environment. So email, um, we've all gotten the email, right? That's respond to this email within 24 hours or we'll delete all of your Google Drive account files. Like that mostly won't happen. In many cases, your Google Drive account's free. Um, there's not a plausible reason why you would receive that email, but you react and, and then, you know, are sometimes a victim of an attack. Um, so oftentimes our social engineers will scour social media accounts, right? For vacation notices, notice that a senior leader at the company is going to Hawaii. Well, they'll impersonate that like CEO, CFO, um, call into the office, ask for a wire transfer because they forgot their wallet and they need to take so-and-so out for dinner, right? It's a classic example. It seems obvious until you're a junior employee in that situation who just really wants to, to look good, right, in front of senior management. Um, and then again, the classic HVAC example of where someone actually physically penetrates an environment, gets access to things they normally would never be able to do. And so th the bottom line here is really there are hundreds of ways for bad actors to breach your perimeter and inflict harm on your environment. And these people are the minority. That's the good news. Like not everybody's out there just to, to create havoc. <laughs> um, good does exist, but it's because of these bad actors that we do have to remain really diligent, um, use multiple layers in our security strategy. Uh, it takes just one really bad incident to put a business out of business. And that's why that zero trust approach, which we'll get into later, is, is really, really important. And Ken today is all about what this means actually for educators. So how has this threat affected those in the education industry? Ken, what do you see on so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. There's a lot of figures and numbers out there around the cost of, of some of these threats to industry, but I found this one to be particularly interesting as we started to look around. And that's that 
higher education and schools in general have been hit harder than any other segment uh, over the course of the pandemic. So in, in 2020, including the cost of downtime repairs, lost opportunities, the average ransomware attack cost institutions an average of $2.73 million. It was $300,000 higher than the next seg uh, segment, which was transportation and distribution. So higher ed is targeted. We're targeted all the time. We're targeted because you know, we support a very wide depth and breadth of user. So there's a lot of ways to get into our organizations. You know, we're typically very loose as an organization, which gives people a lot of opportunity to come in and do damage. Um, so you know, we are a target. We have to accept that and we have to work around that and do the best that we can to protect ourselves. So in from August of uh, in, through September of 2021, just August through September, so just a couple of months in 2021, uh, educational organizations were the target of 5.8 million malware attacks. 63% of the malware attacks that occurred in that period of time were against institutions of higher ed. So again, we are a target. We have to accept that and we have to do what we can to try to mitigate that through a variety of different things. So we're focusing on social engineering, but as you saw earlier, MEC has a number of different presentations that they're doing across this sector to try to help us as we protect our, our assets. Ransomware attacks alone impacted uh, 1,681 schools and colleges in 2020. 44% of all institutions globally were targeted by ransomware attacks in 2020. So this really is a big deal that we need to pay attention to, Megan. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things we hear a lot from our customers in higher ed, whether it be, you know, K-12 or, or higher ed, is that a lot of people don't understand the value of those younger identities, right, on the on the marketplaces. A lot of times you can sell these credentials and create a credit card in the name of a, a minor, and that minor won't find out about it until they try to get their first you know, car loan, student loan, that type of thing. So um, it's definitely a, a, a good target um, if you are in the, the cybercrime industry. So when I think about what makes social engineering so effective, this is one of my favorite quotes, um, because we always consider ourselves to be, well, at least I do, I like to consider myself to be in control, right, of what I say, what I do. But the reality is, is we're all just a bunch of, of people who are emotional, and we tend to, to react before we think. And if you're concerned, like at this point in the presentation, we all, that's good, you should be, but no one needs to be scared, right? Because the good news is, is you can protect yourself and your faculty, your staff, your students from all of those cyber threats that Ken was just discussing by following just like a few basic steps. And so the first is to really understand that hackers may use sophisticated attacks and complex, you know, attack systems that, that maybe you don't always understand, but most of them can actually be outmaneuvered by basic cyber hygiene, hygiene excuse me, and uh, heightened state of, of awareness really of what these threats actually are, what they look like. Um, so staying safe online in most cases just requires us all to sort of slow down, think, and then take action um, while operating under the assumption that everyone you encounter online might be a cyber criminal. Um, this probably sounds paranoid to some people, but it's true and, and you should adopt that mentality because it's there to protect you. And this applies even if you get like an email message from someone pretending to be your own like mother, like definitely validate that that's the case, especially if perhaps your mom doesn't use email all that frequently. So let's take a look at what this all actually looks like. Um, and we'll get into the fun part of today's presentation, which is real media examples of social engineering. So there's a very good chance if you're on this call that you've seen hundreds of examples of social engineering in your lifetime and you've probably seen Ferris Bueller's day off. Um, is Ferris a cyber criminal? No. And if you're wondering why is Megan showing me this, it's because he's absolutely a social engineer, like a textbook great example of of how this looks, even in a non-technical environment. So if you haven't heard the story before, it basically goes like this. Ferris Bueller and his friends, uh, they social engineer his parents, then they then social engineer the principal of the school. Uh, Ferris Bueller's friend Cameron pretends to be Sloan, Ferris's girlfriend's dad, uh, says that there's a funeral that Sloan has to attend. She has to leave school immediately. Um, the principal, Mr. Rooney, if you're familiar with the story, is kind of onto this tactic because it's not the first time this group has tried to pull something like this off. But where he slips up is he doesn't 
verify who that caller is on the other line, right, by calling Sloan's dad at work or some former uh, known valid means of communication. So um, all of this is a, a great fun story. Um, if you've seen the movie, you already know about all the shenanigans that follow, but bottom line, it was a really successful social engineering attack. So like, what can we learn from this, right? So because social engineering is always paired with another attack method, like a phishing email, uh, impersonation, or an insider threat, right? Like in the Bueller case, um, effectively combating this type of threat requires us to take that layered approach we were talking about before. So that includes security controls and, and you know, special processes at every step in what would be like a social engineering attack process. And we usually break those things down into three areas. It's technology, it's processes, and it's the people that are responsible for using the tools or following the processes. So um, in this particular case with Ferris Bueller, um, um, our adversaries could have been outmaneuvered by verifying first then trusting again you know calling the the assumed parent on, a, on an alternative phone number or an alternative email right in today's world um, but then also designing those security controls and processes around the strengths and weaknesses of your people processes and tech and so what i mean by that is like in some cases like an insider attack um, sometimes people are actually better at detecting the threats than technologies or a process um, if they remember to slow down, right, and think before reacting. And then in other situations, actually like detecting malicious websites, maybe detecting malware and a file download, technology can help people where people sometimes fall short. And it's only when we really consider how all these attacks, um, attack types and uh, vectors uh, impact all three layers and design controls and processes around those vulnerabilities, sort of patch the gap and, and get ahead of mitigating that thread. So um, back over to you, Ken. All right, so the next movie, Catch Me If You Can, is one of my personal favorites, and, and it uh, portrays the life of Frank Abagnale. And, and Frank is a real-life social engineer. Um, he started at a very young age. When he was 15, he left his dad on the hook for 3500 in credit card charges. He was buying car parts on his dad's uh, charge card and then returning them for cash. Now, obviously, that didn't last very long. Dad caught on. He was a little bit upset, but uh, you know, it got uh, Frank started in this this new career where he figured out how to get things for free. So then he started got a checking account. He started kiting some checks, and uh, you know, you can't do that so much anymore in the days of ACH. But back in the days, he got pretty good at it. But the banks caught on to that too, and that didn't last long either. So then he got this new idea with banks. What he was going to do is he was going to take deposit tickets, and he was going to put his account number in the bottom of the magnetically coded ink on the bottom, and he was going to randomly insert them into the stacks of deposit tickets at banks. And he did that. Um, and people would pick up the slip, and they'd write their deposit on it, and they'd put it in the bank, and the money would wind up in his account. Uh, well, you know, they caught on to that too. Um, so, you know, he kind of had, had to quit that one. And then one day he noticed that the rental agencies at the airlines um, would place their deposits in a zippered bag at the end of the night and drop them in a night deposit box that was out there for them to use. So he went and got himself a Halloween a security guard costume and he put a sign on the box that says the deposit box was broken and they should leave their deposits with the security guard. And they did. And later when they caught him, they asked him, well, you know, how did you do this? And he said, I can't believe people thought that the actual deposit box would be broken. You know, why did they even fall for this? And he went on. He went on to scam uh, away through Pan Am. He was staying in a hotel um, and he called up Pan Am Airlines and he said he was a pilot and he needed to be on the plane and he had forgotten his uniform. So they actually delivered him a uniform to the hotel. So he donned his uniform, made a fake ID, and he managed to log over a million miles on 250 flights to 26 countries. And when he was when he was caught later, they asked him about this. And he said, well, I would never fly Pan Am because I was always afraid that they would have me step in for a pilot if something had happened. Uh, but the other airlines offered uh, seats to get pilots where they needed to be at the time. So he would always fly on other airlines uh, to avoid the chances that he'd actually get caught and wind up flying the plane. So then he moved into an apartment building. He decided that this, this uh, was not good anymore. He moved on with his life and, and got himself an apartment. And when he, when he rented his apartment, he had passed himself off as an, a doctor. Um, on his lease and he leased his place and he quickly made fun, friends with another doctor in the building. Um, so 
uh, after a little while, the other doctor that he associated with the building offered him a job uh, being a doctor at the hospital that he was at. So he spent 11 months supervising interns in a hospital without ever being a doctor at all. He just passed himself off as it and went in. And one day he actually went into a room and a baby was dying and was completely blue and he didn't know what to do. And he called and the nurses came and took care of it. But then that was his very last day. He left. He was very afraid that somebody would die with him um, being a doctor. So he needed something else to do. And finally he went off and got a law degree. Well, he forged his law degree from Harvard and actually tried the bar exam four times and did eventually pass it and got a job at the Louisiana State Attorney General's office. And it was later one of the other attorneys at the office had been in a conversation with him and they were talking about Harvard. And the other person noticed that uh, his answers weren't consistent with his experiences at Harvard. And they ran a background check on him. And as soon as he heard they were gonna run a background check, he ran away. So, you know, this is a person who, unlike Ferris Bueller, went ahead and just lived this life and did it over and over and over. It's actually a documentary. But this, this whole idea of fraud and getting caught is something we need to think about. It's a really good example of how simple social engineering can be, you know, hanging that sign on the night deposit box. People like to believe. Um, and bad guys are really good at convincing people. You know, Megan talked early on about how marketing and social engineering were very, very similar. And, you know, some of the marketing people are the very best at social engineering. And it's something that uh, the, the bad actors are good at. 60% of Americans now have reported that their immediate family member have been victims of fraud. So, and this is specific to, to COVID right now. It's some of the research that's going on with the Federal Trade Commission on COVID. Um, you know, and now we're also receiving a lot of calls, you, you know, you see them every day, Microsoft tech support, you know, can I help you with your computer? Uh, this is the Social Security Administration, and you need to do something, right? So we're getting this whole idea, and I don't like these terms like smishing and vishing and all of that sort of stuff. I find it confusing. They're just social engineering. It's just different ways of, of doing social engineering, but we're seeing it in every format that we could possibly find. You know, we get mailing, physical mailing in the mail. We get telephone calls. We get voicemails. We get emails. People are coming at us uh, from every different direction. Right now, the Federal Trade Commission um, has reported nearly $900 million in COVID-related losses since January. And bear in mind, this is only losses that have been reported to the Federal Trade Commission. All right, go ahead and flip it, Megan. So according to my best estimate, um, we're catching about 98% of the incoming threats that are coming in through technology means. So SMS and, and phishing email and things like that. We're doing a pretty good job of cleaning it up, but we can't catch everything. So, you know, the most important thing is, is to really leverage at 98%, you know, do the best you can. Uh, make sure you're filtering out things with scanning. Um, try to get as much firewall rule sets, right? Um, application, um, firewalls, uh, web application firewalls, things like that. Get them implemented. Try to stop things uh, coming in. Once something comes in, stop it at the endpoint. You know, look at endpoint detect and response systems. What are you doing at the endpoint? Um, get in there and, and stop it if you can. Once they get in, you need to keep people from moving laterally. So, you know, access control list, segmentation, micro-segmentation, software-defined networking, all of these are tools that are in your toolbox to keep people from moving around within your, your network. And start with leveraging the things that you have. I, it doesn't really matter to me what vendor you're working with. Um, you're probably not leveraging everything you're already paying for. You know, if you don't have robust email endpoint and network protection programs in place, that's really where you need to start because that's where 98% of our threats come, you know, or we're going to stop that 98%. But then again, don't forget about your business processes. Frank scams weren't based on technology. They were based on forged documents, friendly neighbors, weak business processes, right? You're going to hear a lot from both Megan and I about information security awareness training. And it's not just phishing. You know, I've heard it said for years that people are our weakest link in information security. I don't really buy that. You know, we need people and they need to do their jobs and they need access to information to do it. So, you know, I'd argue that really having a strong security minded culture is our best asset. Um, it's not just about clicking, but about recognizing threats and knowing how to respond. So it's about incident response. It's about managing reporting. Uh, you know, how do we how do we educate users on some of those some of those issues as well? 
Um, and, and we need to do that no matter what form it takes, whether it, whether it is coming in with um, telephone or whether it's come people walking into our help desk, you know, how are we combating that? So last but not least is I want to take a look at one of the largest public funding thefts of all time. Um, if you're not familiar with this story, it actually is uh, based out of Dixon, Illinois. So again, another true story. This is unlike Catch Me If You Can, this is, this is a real documentary. It's a great one. I definitely recommend you check it out. But basically, this is a story of Rita Crundwell. Um, and it's a perfect example of how personal relationships, trust, and flawed business processes cost in Illinois City over $50 million in public funding. So I am what I like to call a self-proclaimed horse girl. So I I've always have grown up riding horses. This is, of course, another reason why this is one of my favorite documentaries. Um, but if you don't know anything about horses, all you really need to know is that Rita Crundwell, the, the theft, right, the, the thief in this, in this story, is kind of like the Elon Musk of quarter horses. So that's sort of like the level at which she was at in this industry. And as a teenager growing up, I wanted to, to be this person, right? She was the self-made female business owner. She was crushing it on the, so, the show circuits. Like everyone wanted to be her. No one could touch her. And so she's basically the former comptroller and treasurer of Dixon, Illinois. And for 20 years, uh, Rita diligently picked up the city's mail, including bank statements for a secret account that she created to prevent other employees from learning about her theft and fraud. And when she was away at all of her horse shows, because she took like 12 unpaid weeks of vacation in addition to her four paid weeks on an $80,000 uh, city a salary. So there's there's a, your first red flag. That's interesting. Um, but while she was away at a, at a major show, um, one of the other employees at the city of Dixon started kind of looking into some of the city's bank accounts and, and their financial transactions and spotted some issues that really just didn't make any sense. And it was during this time that that employee actually uncovered the secret account that Rita was using at the time to transfer money from the city into the secret account and then into her own personal finances. So, um, you know, it's just so interesting again, major red flag here, right? No one single employee should ever have single control and ownership over a financial bank account hosted by the city. And everyone obliged because Rita was so nice. I've met her personally several times. She was professional. She was kind. She donated money to all these community causes. No one expected that Rita had this sort of side hustle going on. Um, and then all of this came to fruition uh, basically in fall of 2011. And so after this employee who was stepping in for Rita spotted the, the secret account and the financial statements that didn't make any sense, she took it to the mayor at the time, and then the mayor called in the FBI. And no one at the city of Dixon wanted to believe that Rita was capable of doing something like this, like literally scamming her friends, family, and all the other taxpayers out of millions of hard-earned dollars, but she did. And in addition to, just to kind of give this the gravity of the situation, in addition to all of her horses, all of their equipment, among the assets seized or restrained by the FBI were her two residents in Horse Farm and Dixon, a home in Inglewood, Florida, 80 acres of vacant land in Lee County, a 2009 luxury motor home, more than four dozen trucks, trailers, and otherwise motorized foam farm vehicles, a 2005 Ford Thunderbird convertible, a 1967 Chevy Corvette Roadster, a pontoon boat, jewelry, and a approximately $224,000 in cash from two different bank accounts. Uh, she was convicted of embezzling over $53 million from the city of Dixon, and this still remains the largest theft of public funds in Illinois state history. So, Ken, that's a lot. What can we learn from this type of thing? <laughs> well, we certainly know Rita's not alone. Uh, Marie Thornton was a vice president of Iona College in New York. She pled guilty to embezzling more than $850,000. She'd written college checks for her own use and used a college credit card for making personal purchases and then uh, used false expense claims to uh, get the money. Arthur Fitcher was a project manager at Vassar College in New York. He and his wife, Jennifer, netted $1.9 million before they were caught and sent to prison for creating a fake construction company and charging the college for services that they've never performed. Uh, Christine Bitterman, who worked in residence life at the University of Montana, pled guilty to embezzling more than $300,000 by depositing rent payments for um, residence life for their dorms into her own personal account and then marking them as paid in the, in the university system. 
you know, and when we think about this kind of fraud, there are really the three P's that you have to remember, and that's policies, procedures, and practices. You know, Rita was an insider. She was trusted. She was a trusted friend. She was a member of the community. You know, would your help desk ID Rita if she walked in for services before um, they completed an access request form for her? You know, these are the things that you have to consider and making sure that we don't have those kind of exceptions that we're verifying. You know, and Megan's used the term trust, but verify. We use it all the time. And, and that's really the key to this thing. You know, do you have the appropriate separations of duty in place to make sure that you can uh, ensure the check and balances uh, between, you know, people making deposits and people uh, re reconciling accounts and all of the various things that we see? And many of those things are mandated now, but there are still there's still this trust out there that we have in people. Uh, that they're th that they're not going to make these kind of mistakes. So we just gave a, a few examples of social engineering, but like we mentioned in the beginning, social engineering is usually paired with some other attack method like phishing. And most of the time it starts with phishing, right? That's how they first gain sort of access to, to your perimeter. And so let's take a look at a few different examples of what this actually looks like. And I just wanna pause here for a quick second to remind anyone who's on the call with us, feel free to drop in any questions you have for Ken or myself. We're happy to take those as you have them or you know, right at the end here today. So. Here on the screen, you're looking at an actual phishing simulation template from InfoSec IQ. That's that security awareness and training platform that Deb was mentioning in the beginning. And what makes this particular phishing template so successful is a lot of the same reasons why Rita was successful, right? Everyone knows Facebook, everyone uses Facebook. Um, all the red flags that I've highlighted in red in this email are things that that sort of familiarity kind of buries and make people not quite pay close enough attention to. So um, that email that it came from, uh, this should come from facebook.com, but ooh, authorized notifications.com also sounds pretty legit, Ken. So it must be it must be the real deal. Um, it uses the official logo. You know, a lot of people who don't work in, in marketing or web design, they forget that these logos can be downloaded anywhere. You go to any major brand site and download their media kit and, and make anything look like it just exactly came from their marketing and communications team. Um, it's addressed to me. So can they know me? Like, we must be friends. They, this must be the real deal as well. And it came from the security team. So like, this is serious and I better listen, right? So this is one of those situations where you have familiarity, you have kind of that fear, you have some doubt over like, will I get access? Did someone steal my Facebook account? And these are all things that attackers use in a social engineering attack to get you to click before you think, right? So everything that we do as security awareness and training program managers is to kind of reverse that and flip the script on them. And the stats that I pulled from our system on this, so this is every single person that we do business with, right, at InfoSec, overall, this thing gets a 61% open rate and a 41% fish rate. And I can tell you as a marketer, if I could guarantee a 41% fish rate or a click rate, excuse me, on anything that I send people, like that's a great stat and, and click rate rate would be the equivalent of a fish rate in this situation. If we look at another example, um, this one really plays on what I like to call clickbait. Um, and so basically juicy hot gossip <laughs> that might be floating around the office that people are really interested in learning about, right? So if you're not familiar with what Glassdoor is, um, it provides uh, employee reviews of their employers. And so we drafted this phishing template to really kind of pull at what really gets people to click. So you'll see there's some sample reviews in there, um, got some interesting tidbits like the vending machines are never stocked. I'm not sure if it's because our CEO dot, 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 I would like to know what the CEO is doing with the vending machine. So I might want to click this, right? If I'm if I'm curious and bored and this email catches me on a Friday afternoon. Um, similarly, they have an option to add an employer response. That's some serious power. That could be that could be fun also on a board Friday afternoon. Um, and then just odd, weird stuff, right? That all of us that appeals to, to really all of our personalities. What is the slipper ban that this person talks about? I didn't know our company had a slipper ban. I must check this out. Um, and again, here we see some really strong open and, and click rates slash fish rates. Um, but it's worth mentioning the 14% is significantly lower than that Facebook email because for people who are kind of slowing down and thinking like, why am I getting this email? Why is Glassdoor for employers emailing me? Um, Facebook's just much more widely used. And because of that familiarity, um, you get a higher response. Now you have to imagine what would happen 
if the juicy hot ghost kind of was was paired with the Facebook email, um, what might happen after that. So now let's go take a look at some of the things that that you see, Ken. So Megan, the, the really the question is here is, you know, what would get you to click? Now, in my professional life, I probably wouldn't have fallen for either one of those, at least not in my institutional email, because I'm not going to use that. I, I keep those things to personal email. So maybe I'd click there. I don't know. But if we're looking at our institutional email, what gets people to click? You know, it's the same things. You know, we've got our 2022 benefits enrollment coming up. Look at that. We've got some action required. We've got to click on this link because, you know, there's a problem with our benefits and we all want insurance for next year, right? Um, it's got our logos in it. This, this must be legit. It looks just like what HR sent out two weeks ago. So it's got to be legit. I'm thinking that this would have a much higher click rate, something more in line with your Facebook click rate, Megan, not, not so low like last year. Definitely. Door. You know, people are <laughs> going to think about this. So then you, you go ahead, you click on it, and you're sent to a credential harvesting site. And there you go. This one was interesting. This was actually a fish that we received at our institution. And I got to tell you, this is about a hundred thousand dollar fish here in front of us. So um, originally the bad actor was able to compromise a person's credentials and get into our email and just started watching the email that's coming in to take a look at what it looked like. And they had noticed the in email that our HR department sent out. They said, hey, we can make one that looks a lot like that. So they went ahead and they created this email uh, and sent it to our students. And it was from financial aid, right? You can take a look at that. It's uh, There's a problem with your financial aid application. Oh, no. Um, you know, we better get this clicked. It looked exactly like an email that would be sent out by our financial aid department right to the signature because they were looking at one that came from financial aid when they wrote it. Um, you know, spoofed some email addresses, set it up pretty well, and they went ahead and sent that out to, to the student population. Now, notice the date on there, January 1st. Uh, well, nobody's going to be around on January 1st to, to deal with it. Our financial aid staff would be at home on, on break. We'd have a skeleton crew in Manning help desk. So there really wasn't a lot of activity monitoring what was going on on the date. So, you know, no sense calling. Uh, might as well just log in and check it out. Now, the, the tricky part here is it brought them to a credential harvesting page. Now, if you take a look at that, we always tell people to look at the URL on a credential harvesting page. How many people are not going to notice that WLSC.EU is not WISC.EDU, right? You'd have to have pretty keen eyes to see that, especially in that long string that's up there. Um, so a number of people clicked on it, like 475. And they went ahead and gave up those credentials. And it, you know, it took a it took a lot of resources to clean this one up behind the scenes. But it just shows that, you know, if people have access to information, they have access to logos, they have credit, they have compromised accounts that they can get in and, and take a look at what's going on in your system. Now, this I have to admit, this was before we had multi-factor authentication rolled out to all of our student population. So, you know, the likelihood of something like this occurring again is greatly diminished. But at the time, it, it wasn't all that complicated uh, to pull something like this off. So you would click, you know, I would probably click on this to be completely honest with you. Now, there's some things we're going to do to try to prevent this as a professional, I'm going to use a password manager and password managers are certainly going to notice that it's not uh, WISC.edu, uh, but I probably wouldn't. Absolutely. That's a great example of layering a tool, right, and a technology on top of your people to make sure that when the one doesn't quite do the trick, the other one's there to, to catch them. So it's a good, it's a good example. And so where this all kind of gets interesting is when you think about dark web marketplaces and the $10 billion economy that those marketplaces support. So if you consider that you can buy a fully loaded, ready to use phishing kit on the dark web, um, and then that total figure, right, is 10 billion, it takes a lot of 99 cent, $4.79 phishing kits to, to equal 10, $10 billion. And what you're looking at on the screen right here is an actual screenshot of what a dark web marketplace looks like. And it looks a lot like Amazon. So it's got seller ratings, transaction frequencies. It even comes with supporting products like how to use our malicious phishing kits <laughs> and set them up and configure them. Um, they have support desks just like 
legitimate e-commerce websites do. So if someone, a bad actor were to log on, buy one of these and they couldn't figure it out, someone else out there will help them. And so if you notice the price, again, it's very, very affordable. If you know how to access one of these things, um, the thread out there is, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. It doesn't even really take a technical person to buy one of these and set that up. And to, and to Ken's point on, you know, mimicking your brand, mimicking your login pages, all of that can be done by just downloading like your style sheets from your website and, and you're kind of off to the races. So Ken, this is happening all the time. Anything you want to add on well, this slide? This is, this is kind of fun. Right. I mean, you, you know, you look at this, it's kind of fun. It's appealing. It makes you want to go in and play with these these websites and these toys and fire up a Tor browser and, and go take a look at this stuff. Um, and it's intriguing. It's intriguing for a lot of our students. It's intriguing for other people uh, that are just interested in playing. So you've really got two sides of this. You've got the, you know, the nation state actors that are spending a tremendous amount of money. They're working very, very hard. They've got staff, they've got developers, they've got professionals they are trying to get into our organization all the time. And then at the same hand, you've got this easy access to tools and technologies and blogs. And, you know, you could find this on Reddit. You don't even have to go to the dark web to, to learn about these techniques. And, you know, we've got you know, students and we've got other people that are just, you know, at home and thinking this is pretty cool and they're going to give it a try. So the threats are coming from everywhere and it's got to be something that we're thinking about all the time as we do it uh, and we try to respond to this. And really, this gets back into that education again, the awareness of this, building a culture of security, security awareness training, helping people understand, you know, when they should click when they shouldn't click, when to question something, how do you report something? That's critical, absolutely critical on how do you report it. And then with your organization, having an incident response plan and knowing what to do when something does happen so that you can respond quickly and effectively. You know, in that phishing example I shared earlier, um, you know, we came in on the, the, the next day and by probably 20 after eight in the morning, we had learned about it. We brought an incident response team together. Uh, we deleted all the emails, changed every affected accounts password, and we did that all within an hour. So, you know, having the ability to respond quickly in these kind of incidents is also key to making it work. But the, you know, the point of this slide is just to say it's you know it's not just those nation state actors this is accessible technology anybody can try to get into our systems so we've had a couple questions come in that i think would be really good to, to address now so ken the first one is is why are uh, page source codes like visible i find it handy for learning how other people do things but doesn't it leave people open to copycats and you know i would answer this with yes it does and i think this is a perfect example of how we built this cool internet and all these cool tools before we really thought about how we secure it and lock it down. But also that some business risk and some cybersecurity risk is a susceptible risk, right? Because it unlocks all these other capabilities. Um, so it's a bit of playing that balancing game, taking the risks where you know you can mitigate them and then layering up, right? So if my code is visible and I know these things exist, what other security controls can I put into place so that if someone chooses to copy my brand and use it in a phishing attack, we're, we're on our best foot forward. So Ken, what, anything you want to add to that one? Well, it really is a, a double-edged sword. Uh, because by exposing that, we make it transparent. So we make it transparent to the technologies that are trying to protect us as well. So as I mentioned, you know, a password manager is going to see that the URL is not correct and it's not going to enter your password. Um, and that's true in, in all of the uh, detection systems that we have in place. So that really helps. If we don't show code, then it's easier to obfuscate what we're doing in behind the scenes. And it makes it easier for us to inject malicious code because we the, the technologies can't see that. And, you know, we're not necessarily going to pick it up. So there's a balancing act between that. There are ways that we can obfuscate a lot of the kinds of things that we do over the network. Um, you know, I mean, in the most basic sense, that's what we're doing with the VPN, right? Is we're going to encrypt all of that traffic and we're going to, to send it over the internet encrypted and hide it from everybody so that we can only see it on each end. Um, but then, of course, all of the devices in the middle can't filter on that or don't understand that traffic and can't do much with it. So it makes it easier for data to be exfiltrated if somebody actually does have connectivity to your VPN. Another question came in, and this is more of like from the student protection angle. Um, so 
We've seen an increased rate of social media influencers like cosplayers, video game streamers that are being targeted and hacked. And then the, their audiences, right, are being leveraged to sort of spearhead a, a phishing attack or some other type of cybercrime. Um, so what can we do to help students be more savvy on social media as well? And I think I think kind of even beyond students, how can we help everybody, right? Because I think this, this risk is kind of ageless. Well, I can tell you right off, nobody needs to know what kind of Disney princess you are. Um, don't answer those questions, right? I mean, whenever we're dealing with things on social media, you need to be respectful of your own privacy and especially respectful of other pre people's privacy. Um, and don't share that information. Remember that a lot of that information, even if it seems very innocuous when we can share it, it can be used in social engineering later on. So somebody can come back and say, well, you know, this, this is what we know about you. This is the story we've concocted and we're trying to engage you in this particular activity and you're more likely to fall for it. So that's a big piece of it. Um, you know, then there's just all the simple stuff that, that we've been trying to tell people for a long time, like turn on multi-factor authentication, right? Um, and, you know, some of these technology controls that we have in place, you know, leverage them if you have them, make sure to use them. And, you know, I hear these stories that say, well, you know, they say SMS uh, messaging for multi-factor is just not very good anymore. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't use it. You know, if that's what they offer, that's what you should be using. You know, you should leverage the tools that you have and be wary with the information that you share. And of course, be cautious on anything that you click on. Absolutely. And just to kind of follow up on that, if you don't know what information is out there about you, Google yourself, like create Google alerts for yourself. Understand that anything you do share can then be used against you, right? In a cyber attack. Like if someone is trying to impersonate you or reach out to your friends, I think we've all seen it where we get the dreaded DM about, hey, Megan, I'm so-and-so, or someone creates a duplicate account of one of your friends and tries to reach into your network through that. So just be mindful of it. And yeah, you know, don't trust before you verify. So that's a, that's really kind of the name of the game there. So, you know, to jump back into the slides and kind of wrap things up for today, I think, I think really like what Ken and I are trying to, to communicate is security is, is a game of layers, right? Um, use all the tools you have at your disposal now, kind of hinted at these earlier, but it's endpoint protection, vulnerability management, logging, monitoring, all of those things. And remember that there are no silver bullets. So you're not going to be able to stop everything. And if someone really wants into your network, you you probably won't. And if some vendors telling you they will, then that actually might be a risk in itself, right? Because it just, it just doesn't exist. It's not possible. And that's why things like incident detection and response is also a really important part of your strategy as well. And so to really pull off social engineering effectively, it just requires one hole in one of those layers. And that's why we wanna make sure there's, there's multiple layers in place. Um, and that's why it's so important that your whole team is actually aware of these threats. Um, this is why that zero trust mindset, right? Limiting your attack surface, everything that Ken just said, like don't put out everything about yourself if you know it can be leveraged against you, but also like your colleagues and your friends, right? And someone impersonating you and using you as an attack vector. And um, always remember to design those processes around security and making sure that we're doing the right things in the right ways. Sometimes that means slowing things down, right? And there could be a drop in efficiency or productivity, but if it stops a $53 million embezzlement case from being successful, that's certainly time well spent. Um, so add these checks and balances, even if it might feel burdensome at the time, it's something that uh, really is best practice. And, and Ken, any parting words from you? Well, just, just remember that, that, you know, people may be a weak point, but they're also your greatest asset. You know, we need data and we need people to do the work that we do. So building a culture of security is really your best tool for combating the bad guys, whether it's your IT staff and making sure that they understand it or all of your general users. You know, make sure your people understand the basics of privacy. So one of the courses that I teach is in basic privacy. And it's very, very important for people to understand what privacy is, where it comes from, what does it mean? How does it affect them personally, right? Why does it matter? Why does security matter, right? And teach people how to identify and report risk. It's really important that people are engaged in that process. They're the eyes and ears that are out there. Teach them about all of the different policies and laws that apply to them, FERPA, Graham Leach, Bliley, PCI, whatever else it may be that they encounter, you know, make sure that they're educated and they understand that. So they understand what they're trying to protect and what's expected of them. Keep them engaged. You know, security awareness training isn't something you do once a year, 
uh, as a mandatory training and then let it go. It's something that you need to keep reiterating. You do it through phishing training. You do it through newsletters. You do it through, you know, whatever means you have of keeping that community engaged. You know, have some fun with it. You know, I've heard of institutions that are doing a virtual escape rooms for information security awareness training that have been very successful. It's not something I've done myself, but, you know, it's, it, it's encouraging to hear these things. And, you know, if you're a professional, engage in groups like Educause um, and their uh, higher education information security uh, groups, and they, they have a training and awareness group that I'm currently the co-chair of. You know, these are all resources for you that are out there that you can be engaged in to get ideas and how to engage your community, get, you know, resources. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. We've got a lot of vendors like Megan and InfoSec that do a good job of putting, you know, these phishing campaigns together. And it's not just, you know, trying to trick people, but trying to trick people in a way that's presenting them with positive information and encouragement and helping them to identify some of these risks moving forward. So kind of with that, I wanna uh, uh, thank Megan for inviting me to, to uh, sit in on your presentation today. Um, I've, we've been an InfoSec customer for a while, even before you had the MEC contract, the University of Wisconsin has been engaged with you. So go ahead and share a little bit about InfoSec. Yeah, th thanks so much, Ken. And, you know, kind of to recap back on that other slide, really what our two products do, InfoSec IQ and InfoSec Skills, is they're designed to help you foster that culture of security. So if you've ever been into like a Home Depot or some, you know, like a Menards, you'll see that sign that says, 30 days since our last cybersecurity, you know, our last incident, our last accident. Like, we want to see that same thing happen for cybersecurity. We want to make everyone talking about like joking about team lifting or bending with your knees, but like, hovering over a link before you click, right? And so we do this in two ways. So both of these products are available through the MEC contract. With InfoSec IQ, it's all about security awareness and education for everyone in the organization, right? From marketing to sales to finance. InfoSec skills is going to be that technical skill development for your actual IT and cybersecurity staff. Um, but bottom line, making sure that you have access to resources to teach cyber education, teach you know proper cyber hygiene, build that security culture with really highly role relevant, engaging content that your teams actually want to take and save you a bit of time along the way with those, you know, pre-built like phishing campaigns as Ken was talking about earlier. So if you have any questions about any of this, I won't bore you all with a, an infomercial. Um, you can reach out to myself. You can reach out through, um, through the Mac proper channels there and we'll be happy to, to help you out. But with that, I don't believe there are any more questions unless anyone would like to take this opportunity to ask them now. We'll give you a couple of seconds to jump in. All right, it doesn't look like it. Deb, should we wrap it? Yes, I think we should go ahead and wrap it. So I want to thank you, Megan, and also thank you, Ken, very much for doing this for us today. I um, really enjoyed it and um, some shared experiences there in common too. Ken, I'm glad to know that you won't fall for some you know, basic stuff there. That's good to know. So, and I also want to thank Mary Roberson. She's been working behind the scenes um, to pull this all together. And of course, to thank everyone that took the time to join us today. Thank you.